boxing bullies. Uh, how'd that come about? For me, I've always wanted to create a foundation and give back. And I finally got to a place where I felt like I had the team and the infrastructure to be able to do so. Because it's not easy to make a foundation and keep up with it and to put on events and be consistent and to create a brand just in general. I grew up as a bully just on school buses, like calling people names and stuff. Like, didn't realize what I was really doing. It was just jokes, but that really affects those kids. Which at the time I was like, didn't think it was harmful. But, and, and I was doing it because it made me feel better about myself because I was actually, you know, insecure, I guess, at that time and not confident in myself. And so when I got older, uh, I started posting my videos online and I was getting all these negative comments. People from my school were like, your videos aren't funny, you're an idiot, you're cringe, you're a clown, you're making fun, like you, you look stupid. And that affected me. And it still does like till this day because those comments are real. And basically that was my experience of getting cyber bullied. And I see it as such a big problem in our generation that no one's really talking about. It's, it's crazy because it affects so many young kids. I know it affected me and I, I see it all the time. Negativity on the internet is so powerful. And so just wanted to fight back and raise awareness against it as much as possible. And boxing helped me like gain the confidence to not necessarily care what people are saying about me anymore. I think boxing helped me like find myself, gave me a purpose, gave me motivation, and it made me confident in myself to tell the truth. A lot of the biggest fighters ever turned or found themselves in a boxing gym because of bullying. Mike Tyson, someone, you know, was making fun of him with his pigeons, killed one of his pigeons, boom, ends up in a boxing gym because he wanted to be able to defend himself. So what was involved with bringing this idea to fruition? Man, it was a long process. Months of just like planning, ideation, you know, what are we going to do? What is our purpose? What events are we going to throw? We're renovating a gym in La Perla here in Puerto Rico. And our goal is just to get more boxing gloves out there, uh, renovate more gyms and uh, throw more events to get people, to get kids specifically involved into the sport and just, you know, sort of raise that message. But what do you enjoy about it? When you give, you get. And the first event that we did, I was really nervous. It was here in Puerto Rico. There was like 150 kids coming. I was really, I was nervous. Showtime was filming me. <laughs> so that made it even worse. Like, okay, what if this all goes wrong and it's all on camera? And uh, man, it, it, it just went great. Like the first kid that basically came out to me had a big smile on his face. And that sort of like instantly broke the tension. I took a picture with everyone in there and we just started handing out gloves and everyone just had good energy and they were so thankful. And, it ended up being such a success. When I saw, you know, how uh, inspired these kids were, I saw how hard they were working in the workouts. I saw how they were like so attentive to what I was saying. It just, it, it felt good to be able to teach them about boxing, about my message and to give them, you know, a fun day uh, of just boxing. And we had pizza and ice cream. And uh, I think everyone, it just left a good impression on everyone. Describe the feeling of winning in front of a sold out crowd at Manchester Arena. Definitely one of the uh, greatest accomplishments uh, of my life. I feel like that's part of one of the main reasons I fell in love with boxing because I I'd never experienced that big of a W. Everything about it was crazy. There was so much on the line. It was like US versus UK, brothers versus brothers. When I took that W on the biggest stage possible and I proved everyone wrong and I worked so hard uh, to, to achieve that. And it was my first training camp in boxing and first fight ever. So it was easily like one of the hardest things, learning to box in five months sparring every single day. I would come out bleeding, like I could barely move my arms. It's, it's the hardest sport in the world for a reason. What made you decide to uh, make that transition to boxing full time or, or even start to consider it? I just felt like I could finally be myself and 
sort of take back control of my life uh, as a boxer. Whereas before I was doing all of these stupid things to get attention on camera for my YouTube channel. I mean, when you, when you wake up, uh, you know, uh, two years straight, every single day filming a video for 15 minutes, after like a year and a half, you're like, man, how do we keep this entertaining? Doing stuff that you normally wouldn't do just to get views. And that's such an unhealthy place to be in in life. And I feel like boxing gave me uh, just a purpose and a, and a path. And it fit me so perfectly from, you know, the shit talk, the outfits, the hype, the attention, the actual fight. Like I'm, 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 I'm a fighter. I, I fought for everything I have in my life. I've really built uh, everything from grit, hard work, determination, and it's been a fight. I've learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, and so I feel like fighting is an outlet for me to just express myself. How much did you learn when you went to the mountains in California in Big Bear and visited uh, Sugar Shane Mosley? And that was really where, you know, my passion just went to a whole nother level. And I knew that this is something that I wanted to do for the very foreseeable future. I fell in love with it. And learning from Shane Mosley, you know, what it takes to be a champion. And he would show me that and tell me that every single day, how hard you have to work. And I remember he took me to a, a gym, you know, just as I was starting to get better and better and better, and I was getting a little confident. He took me to a gym and threw me in with this uh, world champion for, for my first time against a world champion. And the, the kid just, you know, beat me up for three rounds straight. I, I didn't give up. He didn't knock me down or anything, but I took a beating. Like I was bruised everywhere, like messed up nose. And uh, Shane was like, you just earned my respect because I know that you'll never quit and you have a champion's mindset. And now I'm even more excited to train you because I know that you're special. Most people wouldn't sit there and just take that beating for three rounds and not give up. What led to the deal with Showtime? Business is business, right? And, and when I'm putting up massive numbers on pay-per-view, you know, Steven Espinoza sees that. You know, I want to legitimize myself as a professional boxer and Showtime was the perfect intersection and platform to go to, to do this. And I told him straight up, I was like, yo, I'm gonna be undefeated. No one's ever gonna beat me. I'm in the gym twice a day, every single day. I'm gonna knock out all these guys and uh, let's do it on Showtime. And, and he took the chance and, you know, it's paid off thus far. And, and your goals are 10 and 0, and you want to fight kind of the next few years, right? Yeah, yeah, two, three, four years. You know, the goal is to get to 10 and 0, maybe grab a world championship belt in the last fight there, and uh, just retire with the belt and ride off into the sunset. And, and you said in terms of financial upside, like 250 to half a billion dollars. If I, if I play my cards right over, which I am, which I have been. All I have to do is to win. The pay-per-view numbers are there, right? So, uh, and the fights are only getting bigger and the, the revenue is only increasing exponentially by e each fight. Uh, so, you know, five, six more fights, I can make $250 million for sure. You have a goal of becoming a billionaire. Um, explain why you love talking to billionaires. I think they create the future and their dedication, their work ethic, and the way they think about life is, uh, is just amazing. The billionaires, once they get to that level, they just wanna see other good people succeed, a lot of them, and they just wanna uplift everyone and give free advice and mentor. And I've never really had a mentor, uh, you know, sort of take me under their wing. And so I've just learned from different sort of people. How well do you remember the unsolicited email you sent to Mark Cuban? <laughs> I was a young entrepreneur creating my first company 
I was 18 years old and uh, my idea was to create you know a social media group almost like a boy band but for social media and I went out to raise money from investors I cold emailed Mark Cuban and he basically uh, said you know I don't I don't think this is a good idea but good luck and rightfully so you know uh, you, you know I probably wouldn't have thought it was a good idea any either but turns out it was you know we became the number one most talked about thing on the internet digitally that there was for about two years straight and I uh, framed his email and put it above my desk <laughs> as motivation every day to just like prove him wrong. And credit to him for at least getting back to you with anything. No, exactly. I mean, it's inspiring. You know, I think I don't look at it as a bad thing. I thank him for denying me. So I want to ask you about some fighters, the first one being Floyd Mayweather Jr. When, when did you first realize that your brother fighting him was actually a possibility? It wasn't until uh, six weeks before the fight where it was actually confirmed. I think uh, Floyd woke up one day and just posted a fight date on his Instagram with like a fight poster. And before that, it was like sort of all just a rumor. I remember being with my brother. It was actually after I beat Ben Askren and uh, we were in Miami celebrating and we both like woke up hungover and he was like, oh, I guess this is real. June 6th, I'm fighting Floyd. And uh, he immediately flew uh, here home to Puerto Rico and just started training in training camp. When you grabbed his hat, uh, what are you thinking? Man, I, I wasn't thinking past just that moment. It was sort of like a uh, reckless mission where I just really became obsessed with the idea of taking his hat once I saw it. And once he was, he was insulting me. <laughs> he was insulting me in the press conference. And so I was like, oh, okay, like, you want to loop me into this? Uh, no problem. And I was like, okay, the only way that this is going to work is if I go up to him, act like I'm talking smack, and then just snatch it and see how far I could run. And, and your, your brother was actually initially mad at you, right? I think he was just caught off guard. He was scared for me because he didn't know what happened. Like he, he saw me getting jumped by, you know, 20 different guys. <laughs> so as an older brother, he, he was freaking out and panicking. Yeah. And then I think he realized like, oh wow, that just made this fight so much more real. Right. The storyline got 10 times better because Floyd's pissed off. Now he wants to kill the Paul brothers. And then the next day, news articles come out saying he's training harder than he was training against McGregor to fight Logan. So now the fight just got that much more real. The videos accumulated over a billion dollars in media value for free just because I got punched in the face. And I'm like, yo, I just sold you probably like 400,000 more pay-per-view buys so you could thank me later. What do you think of Canelo? I think he's great, man. I respect him. You know, I think uh, we've had words back and forth and you know he says I need to work on my boxing ability and I agree like of course 100% I do and uh, I've really come to like his personality actually I think when he started uh, you know doing more media showing his life behind the scenes he never really had done that before and I watched your guys sit down talk and I realized you know he's a good guy and maybe in a different lifetime uh, we, we would probably be, be friends. However, I still want to fight him. And I still think it would be a massive fight. And I think, you know, my uh, path is leading to that. And this year, 2021, uh, Canelo will be the number one highest paid boxer. And I will be number two. So what better fight than to put the number one highest paid and the number two highest paid against each other because that equals the biggest payday. And at the end of the day, this is a business. So as much as I respect them, I think three years from now, 
us getting in the ring will A, be massive, and B, three years from now, my skill level will be good enough to make it a serious competition. What are the obstacles with you and Conor McGregor fighting? I think Dana White is the obstacle, number one. You know, letting, if Dana would let Conor out of his contract to set up the boxing match, uh, I, th I think that's what is needed to make it happen. And I think that will, I think that will happen. And if Conor is, you know, gonna just continue to lose fights, he's, lost, he's one in four in the past five years. And so if he's just gonna continue to lose, there's not much Dana's gonna be able to do with him anyways. So cash him out one more time. But his manager is good friends with my manager, is good friends with another one of my advisors. And they talk constantly about making it happen. And they're like, yeah, we're, we're, we're down, we're about it. And, and so if uh, Dana is the, the biggest obstacle, what, what's the deal with you guys? You have some, uh, like you, you said, the, the feud is kind of personal. Uh, not, not for me. I, I think it's personal for him. Okay. You know, because he's this old guy who is clearly like a control freak. Uh, and I'm the only one that's able to get under his skin. Although it was a funny Halloween outfit you posted. Yeah, the Coke like smeared across my face in the Coke bag. On the, and I put UFC, unlimited free cocaine. Because, I mean, everyone knows about Dana's Coke uh, issue and all the hookers and shit. But uh, I'm just a young kid having fun. Dana has the audience that I want. And so he doesn't realize that he's just playing into my game. Because... I have the YouTube audience, the digital audience, the TikTok, the, all that. What I want is the fight fans who will pay $60, $70, $80 to see me fight. And all he's doing is making me 10 times more relevant in that space by playing my game. You said you've, when it comes to money, you've had trust issues before because uh, people have stolen from you. Yeah, it's uh, when you're young and you start to make millions of dollars really fast. You have people on your team who are, take advantage of you. They're, you know, redirecting some money here. They're overcharging you for hours. Uh, they're making you buy insurance policies that they get a percentage on, you know, little, little things like that. And I never really looked at my expenses, which was like a, the stupidest thing I ever did because you know, I was 19, 20 years old. Boom, boom, $5 million, $10 million coming in. And I just never thought to look at it. What uh, caused you to catch it? I literally woke up one day and I was like looking around my house and there was like 15 employees. And I was like, what are all these people doing? Like, what's going on? Like, why am I paying all these people? Like, what does that person do? Because I wasn't necessarily the one that hired them. Like, what? Like, are these people really, like, worth paying? Like, I, like what is it? I don't know. And I literally just started questioning everything. And I was like, you know, is my manager even worth pay paying? Or am I just, like, giving them 20% for, for what reason? And then I got my, uh, another, like, trusted advisor to basically come in and look at everything. And along with my dad, and they uncovered millions and millions of dollars that were lost and gone really? and disappeared or, you know, in different accounts. And uh, it, it was like months and months and months and almost a year and a half of just dealing with all the crazy How much do you think you lost all in? I think it's like r roughly like three million dollars. And as painful as that is, probably ended up being the best thing that ever happened to you in terms of long-term money management, right? Best thing ever, it, which I didn't realize at the time. At the time, I was like, oh wow, you know, I'm, I might have to give all of this up because like really? my expenses are so high. I, this was stolen from me. I realized, like, you see, when you're making that much money as a kid, you, you, you just look at the number that's coming in. You don't look at the expenses. My, at one point, my expenses were like a million dollars a month. 
and, and I didn't even know it. And I was like, okay, cool, I'm making like $2 million a month. But like, after taxes and blah, 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 you're down to zero dollars. So it's like, oh my God, what's going on here? And so yeah, it was a blessing in disguise because if it would have happened to me now, it would be 10 times worse of a situation. So now I look at every expense down to you know, the people trimming the hedges and how many hours they are spending at the house. How do you invest your money today? A lot of different ways. I guess the main focus is anti-fund, which is my venture capital fund, along with my partner, Jeff Wu. And a lot of my own personal money goes into the fund, and we focus on anything and everything from you know, cannabis to crypto, to metaverse projects, to consumer products, software, social media apps. And it's really just startup, venture capital, Silicon Valley, old school uh, investing. And I found a, a ton of success in it. The fund's been absolutely crushing it. We've made, you know, a, a couple investments. Uh, that where the companies have turned into billion dollar companies, billion dollar market caps. And uh, I've been involved in that since I was 18, 19 years old. Oh, you know, since I raised money for my first company, mm -hmm. that's when I sort of got involved in venture capital and understood exactly, you know, what it is. Because it's really complicated. A lot of, a lot of people don't even know what it is or how to get involved. And you, a lot of people don't talk the talk or walk the walk. And especially, you know, athletes or celebrities. So we sort of bridge the gap between Hollywood and tech investing, really. How about best and worst financial decision you made? I would say the best financial decision I've ever made is investing into anti-fund and investing just a ton into uh, Ethereum and uh, BNB very early on and venture cap, just putting my money in venture capital uh, with amazing founders. The worst <laughs> flexing, flexing too hard in, in Los Angeles, trying to be cool with like jewelry and uh, cars and houses and all that crazy stuff. And before you know it, your expenses are a million dollars a month and it's not looking good. <laughs> your parents got divorced when you were in kindergarten. Uh, your mom was a nurse, remarried a doctor. So, you know, things were, seemed pretty secure there financially, but um, your dad, on the other hand, struggled a, a bit. And, you know, I think there was like Pop-Tart and Pop-Tarts and soap and uh, th things like that that you would get on Christmas wrapped in a uh, newspaper. How, do you, what, how does this man know this? What, what, I mean, what, what, was that, what was that like for you guys, just kind of that, the difference in dynamic from one house to the other? It was weird, to say the least, and it was a lot to adjust to. And I feel like that's, it sort of developed as an adult into like having like mood swings for me personally, because at my dad's house, I couldn't be myself. I was always on, on edge of not doing anything wrong in front of him. We were always working, and it was very serious, going to bed at a certain time. Like, he, he was in the army, so he like sort of brought that mentality into our lives of like a regimen. And then I would go to my mom's house, and it was a lot more chill, and I could play video games, and uh, hang out with friends more. Uh, so it was a week with my mom, a week with my dad, and then it was sort of this back and forth, and I just got so used to it, I didn't really know, like, uh, this is all I really knew. Uh, but I definitely noticed how the effects it has, like, now in my life, where I feel like I either need to have to be, like, working, 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 and, like, on edge and anxiety, and I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing enough, and then, or I'm, like, chilling. What do you think you learned from each parent? From my mom, I learned a lot about love, care, you know, patience, determination. Uh, she's the one who taught me about like affirmations, like the things I have in my mirror. And for my dad, I think I learned just how to be tough, 
how to work hard, how to be disciplined, and how the real world isn't gonna take it easy on you. One of your earliest memories is, uh, as a kid is uh, of the cops coming in, breaking up an explosive domestic dispute. What do you remember from that? Yeah, I just remember, it's sort of like all a blur, but I remember my parents just like screaming at each other at the top of their lungs and them arguing and I, I was just crying w you know, with my brother and I, they didn't want us to see the fight so they like put us in the laundry room and me and my brother were just sitting in there crying and then I remember all of a sudden there was like two cops that came in and uh, just asked us if we were okay and what was going on and and I just, we just had no idea like what was going on. How do you think that sort of stuff or the, the divorce, looking back now, um, affected you guys? It's, you know, it's hard to say, but I mean, traumatic experiences like that, you know, sort of make you numb. I think they make you live in fear. You know, when you go through something like that as a child, when you're so impressionable, uh, those, the, that pain and that, those emotions, that confusion, of course it's gonna it's gonna linger with you for the rest of your life in what ways does it come out who knows you know um but you know everyone has it. i'm not sitting here being like oh you know i went through so much stuff. like i did and i didn't you know everyone there's people who have it way worse than me um stealing the iPhones. I was talking to your mom the other day on the phone and she said it was actually a lot bigger than even he made it out to be in his book. Take me through what happened. Yeah, basically I was a, a freshman in high school and I wanted to make money and I was sort of hanging out with the wrong people and uh, they started stealing iPhones and flipping them for like double the amount to this like senior in the school who had a cell phone shop with his dad downtown. I was just a kid with wide eyes and I just like wanted to make money. The first time I got involved, I like distracted a kid and then they like took, their, took his phone and I felt bad and I knew it was wrong. Uh, but for some reason it didn't like all register to me to like stop doing this and these were my best friends So it was like You know as a kid you don't know you don't know any better. I think I took like three or four phones and then You know two weeks later <laughs> We're all caught and it didn't last for long at all, but, you know people started tattletaling and uh, I ended up getting suspended for ten days. How did you get punished? so Oh, lots of <laughs> lots of punishment, but the thing I remember the most is uh, my dad's house. It was a big property, and there was uh, ten yards high of firewood by twenty yards wide, and he just made me move it from the backyard to the front yard, wheelbarrowing it through mud, through the grass, literally a half, like a half mile walk. Uh, and it took like four days. Did he, he explain to you why he was punishing you that way? Yeah, he's like, I want you to think about what you did the whole entire time while you're moving the locks. And I just remember there was like a moment where it, it was like the, in the one spot, it was like really muddy. And so I, ha I had the wheelbarrow and every single time I went through that spot, I was like, it was extra hard and you had to be extra cautious. And I would, I was loading the wheelbarrow up to the, very top as heavy as I could because I don't want to like waste trips you know and so I'm going through the mud and boom like I slip tip over the 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 thing on the wheelbarrow like stabs into my stomach I like flip over land on my back and uh I was literally like sitting there in the mud like this is the worst thing I've ever done I'm not gonna do anything bad again but, <laughs> but so, I mean, going through it had a positive impact. Yeah, for I mean, sure. Yeah. I, I, I think it, it, was, it was much needed. You and your brother were so competitive, one kind of motivated the other, yet he excelled in school. 
and your mom said she was just hoping you would be a, a C student. Why do you think you struggled so much in school? I mean, just to be candid, like I'm, I'm way smarter than my brother. <laughs> and so, and people, people will sit there and be like, ah, whatever they could say about that. But it, I mean, it's just becoming more evident as, as we get older. And so, like, I think he's smarter in certain areas. I'm smarter in other areas. But I feel like I always beat around the bush to this question because I'm always framed as like the, the bad child. My, my, and, I, and I run with it because I, I was. I'm the problem child. But I think smarter people sometimes in school are harder to engage because they're like, what, like what, why am I here? What's the point of this? I don't like this. I don't enjoy this. I'm not passionate about this. And I was sitting there the whole entire time like thinking to myself, why is this teacher who is a failed whatever they are teaching me about something that I'm never going to use in my life? I want to learn from people who are successful and who are actually doing things out there in the real world, whereas my brother didn't care. He, he just wanted to excel because that was what he was told to do. And I just never wanted to engage because I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world to sit in a classroom and be taught about the Pythagorean theorem or the quadratic formula, you know, uh, which our education system in today's society is, is, is horrid. And it turns out I, I, I was right. Like, wh why am I sitting there doing that when there's a million other ways to become successful in life? And why aren't we taught that in school? Why aren't we taught simple things like how to file our taxes in school or what a mortgage is or what a loan is. Why aren't we taught any of those things? And the reason is, is because the government doesn't want our society to be smart. No, oh, come on. hundred <laughs> percent. I'm an investor into this company called Synthesis, which Elon Musk created. So, I mean, he, he, what, he's the smartest guy of our generation, right? He created his own school for his kids with, with his partner, and that guy spun out and is now using that company called Synthesis to educate kids. On the Logan front, you said about him, but uh, I read somewhere, I envied Logan, who was always college bound and planning on becoming an engineer. At least at that time, that was your thinking. Why? I envied the praise that he got from teachers and my parents, because I, I was like, I could, do the same exact thing if I wanted to. And my parents never gave me love or praised me f for what, like, I mean, I wasn't accomplishing anything, so like, rightfully so, but they should have still loved me anyways. Well, you why, felt like why, they why loved you less? Yeah. Really? Yeah, 100%. And, and, and teachers as well. Why, the teachers always are like, loving the people who are doing great when it's really the, the students who are performing bad are the ones that they need to help more and show more love and attention to. How did it make you feel at the time? I don't really know how I felt. I feel like I had a lack of emotional intelligence then. So I didn't really like, I couldn't compartmentalize my feelings. I think everything was just like, just, I just accepted it. In what ways were you and your brother competitive with one another? It was mostly sports. I didn't really care about school, but I cared about sports, so I wanted to excel. And uh, I remember the biggest thing was we both played the same exact position, running back and middle linebacker, but he was two years ahead. And so in a weird way, I've still done that up until this day, to be honest. You know, how much money did you have by the time you were 21? Okay, you're 23 and you have X amount of dollars, but I'm 21 and I had more than you did when you were 21. So it was like literally the same thing. And you guys kind of would motivate each yeah. other. Yeah, I think there was parts of it that were super unhealthy, but... It, it, like what? I mean, when you start to m make your life all about success, which I was guilty of before, you know, and, uh, and about growing your wealth, it's just not, it's, it, it's just not good. It, it, it leads to unhappiness. And so, for us, we never had anyone who was successful, right? And all of a sudden, you know, how hard I saw my dad work cleaning gutters, building porches, snow plowing driveways, 
rebuilding houses with his bare hands, and he would make $60,000 in a year working every single day. And then all of a sudden, we would make that in one post on a stupid app for five seconds. We were so motivated to work and grow and work and grow, and it became an obsession almost. Speaking of your dad, uh, w one of the best decisions he probably ever made was Christmas 2007. Tell about the handheld video camera. We, we were running backs on, on the football team and my dad got my brother and I one camera to record our football games was the, was the purpose so that we could watch back the film. Summer rolled around and in Ohio, this is before cell phones, there's nothing to do. My dad has to go do work and we were, you know, too young to work with him at the time. I was probably nine, Logan was 11. One day we just picked up the camera and started recording random stuff outside, trying to be like the YouTubers and making funny videos and jokes. And we had a blast doing it. And one, one thing led to another. And I think a couple of weeks later, we had like actually made our first real YouTube video. Once we started filming everything and watching it back uh, on the little computer we had, we were just like to be sitting there laughing and laughing and laughing. And then the conversation just came up one day of like, we should make a YouTube channel. And we called it L Dog and J Slice. And you mentioned some of the videos are still online. Some aren't in part because one day Logan says, uh, I want to stop the channel and then deletes a bunch only to later kind of change his mind. What do you remember about each of those instances? Yeah, so Logan was going into high school and he thought the videos were embarrassing. And so one day without telling me, he went on the channel and deleted like maybe 20, 15 to 20 videos of the ones that he didn't think were as good. Mm -hmm. And I remember just like freaking out, like, why did you do that? What, like what, how could you do that? Th th we worked so hard, you didn't even ask me, you didn't tell me like, what do you mean these videos aren't cool? These are the greatest things ever. They had to be devastating for you at the time. Yeah, but like I, I he was my partner in crime. So yeah, it was like he checked out and I was upset, but there was nothing I could do about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then not too long after that, there was a change of heart. Yeah, um, two, about two years later, Vine came out and I downloaded it the first day and just started you know, sort of picked up right where we left off, you know, making Vine videos. And I told my brother about it. He downloads it. We're both just like messing around. We think it's a funny platform. Can we get uh, two tickets to paradise? Or do you not sell them? You're actually making like pretty good content uh, for, at the time. And that's uh, when Logan and I got into a competition immediately <laughs> to see who could get more Vine followers. Worked out pretty well for both of you. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we just started putting more effort into it and we were literally just competing like, you know, who can get more followers. And one of the videos that we made uh, went viral like a month later. And we were like, holy, like, this is crazy, you know were famous. <laughs> in, in your process for creating content was what? In the process of ideation for the videos, it just like has evolved. It went from, you know, messing around and maybe filming a video for 10 minutes to spending days of pre-production to get props, costumes, locations, to film a six second video <laughs> and editing it for a day after that and then posting it. So they just got better and better and better and better and just put way more effort into it.
And whether Vine or later YouTube, it, the, the process was pretty consistent throughout? Exactly. The reason we were so successful on YouTube when we came into, into YouTube was the content on the platform at the time was just slow and it was boring and it sort of lulled you to sleep if you would sit there and watch someone's 15 to 20 minute video. So when I came in, I was like, I'm gonna make this 15 minute video just a bunch of vines. Six, you know, six to 30 seconds at a time because people's attention span are very short. And so I wanted something new to happen on camera every 30 seconds, every 45 seconds, every minute to keep the audience engaged and it worked. To what extent is it still frozen in your memory, you and your brother being driven off by your dad to the airport as you're going to spend the summer in LA? So Logan drove to LA because he had a parrot and he couldn't take the parrot on the plane. And I had to finish my junior year of high school. So I finished my finals test and flew, I flew to LA since I wasn't 18 yet. My parents were like, you can only go for three months. And so I was supposed to be going for the summer, but I knew that wasn't gonna happen. I was gonna convince them. To, you, to you, let even me stay. then, even from the outset, you knew you weren't going back to school and you were staying in LA. Yeah, and, and that only increased three days after I got to LA and was like, this is the most fun I've ever had in my life. This is the greatest city in the world. A video a day for 800 straight days. Uh, how much of that was fun? It had its ups and downs, but I think by halfway through, it, it was more work. And it wasn't really something I was passionate about. You could just see like, oh, this kid is like, just doing this because it's, it's fueling his brand and his page and his following and his revenue. And the, the pressure to create content you felt started to cause you to drink, right? It, it was just a messy cycle because when I didn't want to do something, I was like, oh, I'll, I was like smoke weed or get drunk to do this video because it, that'll make it more fun. But then all of a sudden, you know, you're developing these like bad habits. That's where it's different for me because I had to do it every single day. At what point was it the worst? There was a point where I, everything went down the hill for like the Paul brothers. It was after my brother's uh, Japan incident where no one wanted to work with us. Every brand that I was affiliated with dropped me. It, it, and I, I wasn't even the one who filmed the video, right? It was just by way of association because my brother filmed in the suicide forest. My life was pretty much ruined. YouTube demonetized me. Every brand dropped me. I had like a $10 million deal with Target that was gonna go live uh, like seven days from that. They dropped me, everything just went downhill and... You're thinking what at the time? <sighs> what the f am I gonna do? Because I never saw this happening and it happened overnight. And y you said uh, it was starting to create a kid who was just like, I mean to be blunt, it's like, why do you see so many stars kill themselves? Yeah. Explain that. I'm, I'm sitting there 21, I lose basically all my income because of something my brother did. I'm blacklisted, I'm not in the community anymore. They bring up everything that I did wrong. They sort of lumped it all in together. Like, Look at these Paul brothers and how bad they are. We got canceled everywhere. And so I just saw every, everything in my life was just falling apart. And the only thing that made me forget it was drinking 100% and smoking weed. That only makes it worse, right? Because you're using a crutch to, to get by and then you know, you sort of wake up one day and I'm in this empty house uh, with everything that I had built basically stripped away from me and people hated me. I thought my, fr my own friends who I thought I would be with know forever, they were gone. And I was like, what's the purpose of my life? This sucks, this is terrible, I wanna run away. And I think, you know, dark thoughts come into your head of like, yo, this this is uh, 
yeah, this is, like, I don't want to be here on Earth anymore. Did you think about taking yeah. your own life? Yeah, 100%. How did you get through it? I think uh, at the time I was just looking for hope. And so I just, like, started going to, like, church. I would just, like, start talking to uh, adults who would have any sort of advice. Just, like, talking to a therapist. I was just like, this is exactly what everyone wants, you know? The media wants to see me fail. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to give them what they want. And I just made the decision to, like, wake up every day, cha change my attitude, really. And I just started telling myself every single day when I woke up in my bed, I would sit there and just be like, I'm happy. I'm going to be happier next week than I am this week. I would just start telling myself these things. And uh, it, it helped, and I just made that decision to like not give up. When I was talking to your mom, she said uh, it, it wasn't until you were kind of on the other side of it that she really had any idea what you were going through. Yeah, I was embarrassed, you know? Why? Even now, it's like, oh, this is like really the first time I've like talked about it, honestly. I just took on, took on the pain by myself because I, I, I just felt embarrassed to ask for help. And I didn't want, like I wanted to seem tough, right? Because I was Jake Paul and everything, uh, the outside looking in, it's like this kid has a perfect life. He has the cars, he's, uh, he's in LA, he's living his life, you know, he's famous, da, 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 he's having fun. So on the outside looking in, I didn't want to look weak to anybody, including my closest friends. I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want to cry for help. I wanted to make it through it by myself or, or with the help of, you know, sometimes I would talk to the occasional person who was outside my circle that I could trust. You said it, it took a while to realize that it's not the money or the cars and the girls that make you happy, but figuring out a balance. It was going through that, really, because I had everything, right, in a sense. Like, I, I accomplished what I set out to accomplish, and, I, and then I was, wasn't fulfilled at all. And I was like, I wish I was back in Ohio landscaping for $10 an hour because that was, I was happier then than I was as a 21-year-old with, you know, the houses, the cars, the parties, the lifestyle. It's all fake and it, it's just a dead end, honestly. Why did you say you felt you didn't grow at all from 17 to 21? I, I mean, I think a lot of reasons, but I was just living like my life, I guess, for cameras mm -hmm. and for content. And I, when I sort of stopped filming every day, like life like smacked me in the face. And I was like, what did I just do for the past four years? Like I, I felt like I did all of that work and all of the things and I, I felt like I had uh, nothing to show for it. I sort of almost dug myself into a, de into a hole, a deeper hole, uh, financially, uh, all the issues that I had. I was like, I had like six lawsuits at the time against me for whatever it was. On that front, because I was uh, watching a, a clip of you and your brother's podcast where you were talking about the, the lawsuits and you got really uh, emotional. What was it about that that affected you so much? When you get sued for some ridiculous thing, it, it's just awful. Um, it's time consuming. It takes a toll on your life and it's very, very expensive. And no matter what, you know, you want to settle, right? You don't want to end up in court. And you almost probably want to settle even if you didn't do it exactly. just so you don't have to screw with it anymore. Exactly. And so, But then if you do am, that, that encourages more people to exactly. file lawsuits. lawsuits. Right. It takes a big toll on your life 
and it, even on my mom's life. My mom was the one sitting there collecting records, proving innocence, going through all these cr like crazy stuff for hours. What do you think the solution is to it? I think they all came from YouTube and, and content, making content. Really? So it all stemmed from filming videos and people being pissed off because of whatever videos. Uh, pretty obvious to like identify the problem. And it was part of my decision, you know, to stop filming, to just put the camera down and give, give it up because it's just this vicious and never ending cycle. So we were at your house earlier, you showed me uh, that painting. This is the moment after I knocked out Ben Askren in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I was going through a lot uh, that, that week uh, leading up to the fight, and it was just messing with my mind a lot. And when I won, it's like you, you, you sort of just get to that other side and all those emotions come out. Just days before that win, Paul was accused of sexual assault by TikTok star Justine Paradise, who says the assault happened two years earlier at Paul's home, which doubled as the headquarters for his social media influencer label Team 10. Other influencers who lived at the house have also alleged toxic and abusive behavior by Paul. Paradise has stated she plans to press charges. Paul has denied her allegation. What was your lowest point during that period? The day where like an allegation came out um, and you know, everyone in the world is like jumps on the opportunity, right? When you see a star start to fall or to be accused of something, all the haters come out of the woodwork. And that's a tough one to come back from, but yeah, and I mean, it's the headlines are plastered. Yeah, it's, no, it's a, yeah, it's a smear on my name for the rest of my life. And just knowing that and knowing like, wow, like we live in a society where someone can make a claim about an individual and it could ruin or mess up things in their life for forever. And it's terrible. I was just like, this is, this is absurd. This is such a lie. This is, uh, this is everything is fabricated. It, it made me sick to my stomach. And, you know, before you know it, people from the event, oh, this sponsor's pulling out, this sponsor's pulling out, you know, we might have to cancel the fight, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, wow, I just worked. You know, I, I made it out of this situation with, with my brother in Japan, where every, uh, everyone, all, everything, lost all my money, dropped, all the sponsors dropped me, made it out of that squeaky clean, two years running, <laughs> just for one day to wake up and it felt like the cycle was repeating itself. How did it affect you? You know, I, I, I sort of just try to laugh about it because it's like, it's just another person, another, another one of these people trying to make it up to tarnish my name. I mean, the people around me had to question it. You know, they wanted to know too. My, my business partner pulled me aside, you know, and my fund was like, hey, what the f Tell me the truth here. Tell me, tell me the God's honest truth, man to man, no one listening. What happened? So, and my brother did the same thing. And what, what do you say? This is a completely made up, fabricated story. This girl is a liar. It, this absolutely did not happen. I've never laid a finger on a girl without their permission. And it's devastating to be accused of, of such a thing. And correct me if I'm wrong, but nothing's come from it legally of course since not. then, right? Of course not. I think someone paid her to do it. Really? 100%. Why? I mean, something like that just doesn't come out six days before, you know, a massive fight. Lesson learned from going through that. Don't trust anybody <laughs> and you know, I, I wake up every day sometimes scared because it's like, what, what, what's someone going to say? That everyone will just believe. The, I mean, what lesson do you really learn? It's just, it's just terrible. And, and I think it, th there needs to be criminal 
uh, punishment for this type of shit. for people who accuse people of doing things that they didn't do. First, I, I have to ask a, a question that I just don't get. And I talked to, uh, when we did the taping with Mike Tyson, uh, he talked some about this. The no sex before a fight thing, like. It, it's different for each fighter, but a lot of fighters are affected by it, including myself. And you're sure this isn't just all mental? I'm sure, 110%. I, I'm not, I, I don't believe in placebo. I have to experience things for myself. And you notice that has a positive impact? Yeah, it's night and day. I've only messed up like on occasion, once or twice, because it's noticeably different and I take more punishment in sparring if I do that. And my coach, BJ, will be like, did you have sex last night? It, it, you can tell without me even saying anything. He's just slower. He's not as good, he's not as quick, he's not as, as fierce, he's not as aggressive. It's, just, it's obvious to a guy who's been around boxing for, you know, I'm 42, I've been around boxing for, you know, 33 years. So I see it very quickly. And he always comes clean because we have like the whole, you know, full disclosure thing, me and him, we don't, there's no lies, it doesn't matter what it is. And ancient warriors, they deprive themselves and they sacrifice certain things before they go to battle. And it's important that Jake sacrifices and deprives himself of certain things before he goes into battle, because that's exactly what this is. This is a battle. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure um, my guy has every single advantage that is possible when he goes into that ring. And uh, if, if not having sex for a little while will make us a half percent better, then I'll take it. Uh, the side effects of boxing, uh, you have said uh, mood swings and memory loss. Since I was a kid playing football, I was getting concussions all the time. You know, hard hits, helmet to helmet. It's a part of the sport and boxing is no different, you know? And especially when you're first starting out, sparring really tough people who are on a much higher level than you, you're gonna get concussions. How many concussions do you think you've had all in? Uh, that's hard to say, uh, you know. It, it, it's really hard to say, but, you know, I would say 20, 25, 30, maybe. That has to scare you? Of course, you know, if you're doing something that you know is detrimental to maybe your long-term health, and I notice it in conversations of like, with my girlfriend or friends, like, not remembering something that I should be able to remember that happened a couple of days ago. Sometimes in my speech, where like, there's like a, every hundredth or two hundredth word, I'll mess up or like slur, which I didn't do that before. But I've talked to, you know, tons and tons of people about it. And, uh, you know, there, there, there's new research and science to be able to sort of combat against it. Things like psychedelics, toad, which is like five, M-E-O-D-M-T. This is like what helped Mike Tyson cure his Parkinson's was shrooms and uh, sm like smoking toad, which is like an ancient cultural thing. Sounds crazy and it is, but it can actually increase the uh, neuro activity in your brain and open up new uh, pathways in, in your brain. And so I've, I've experimented with that and it's definitely helped out. A oh, really? Yeah. Um, and talk about when you got your brain scanned. Yeah, I, so I got my uh, brain scanned right before I started boxing, actually. And, uh, you know, the doctor told me there's, there's lack of blood flow from the concussions I had when I played football into certain areas of my brain. One of them being, uh, I believe, the frontal lobe, which you know, is sort of that is partially like memory and so on and so forth. And so after my first year of boxing, I went back and there, it was it was worse. What did the doctor say? I mean, you know, their advice is don't do that sport, right? I mean, that's all they can advise as a doctor. I think before it was affecting me a lot more at a rapid pace because I wasn't, I never took it easy. I was always thrown in there with 
people who were way, way better than me until I started to slowly get to their level. All right, so uh, what, what were you telling uh, me on like the- Like putting me on the spot? Yeah. Yeah. What were you telling them? Uh, I was just saying that I met my person, my soulmate. Who is she? <laughs> is she cool? Can I meet her? <laughs> and <laughs> that we uh, we just talk about like having kids and a family, mm. but we don't like we're we talk about it, but we don't know if we're ready. But like yeah, yeah. So how how did you two meet in the first place? <laughs> we met on um, his music video. I got casted. I was joke because I got casted to be his girlfriend, uh -huh. and I just say they never yelled cut, so I'm just still playing the part, you know. <laughs> All right, when when did you know? Uh, you know, there was something there. I told her I loved her the first day that we met. Oh, come on. I swear to God. And I, I've never done that ever. Like, I've only, like, I don't love people and who's, like who's that. This, guy this, is this is Thor. This is Thor. This is our best friend. He's my best buddy. He's but, uh, yeah, I, I seriously told her. I, I knew I loved her. I was like, by the, it was like six hours we spent together, and I was like, yeah, was this is the coolest girl I've ever met. <laughs> and so I literally just told her, I was like, I, I love you. Um, what, what did you think when this guy He's you just crazy. six hours ago said He's it? psycho, but I like it. Yeah. <laughs> it was on again, off again for a while, but that mm -hmm. kind of ultimately made the relationship uh, stronger. Uh, how so? I mean, we just like went through a lot of <laughs> and yeah. that's okay. You know, when you're young kids with a lot of responsibility and, and the spotlight and the media is involved in your relationship and fans are involved in the relationship, it's hard. And so we just got through that because at the end of the day, we just knew we wanted to be together and that we loved each other more than anything. Like I've, I've never had a best friend, like true best friend. And uh, every day that we weren't together, I would think about her. When I woke up, when I went to sleep and it was just like, we need to find a way to make this work. It's a little sappy, right? It's a little sad. Is it's kind of sad. sad. I'm glad he's showing this side because <laughs> yeah, I normally, normally I don't really like that. Mr. Tub, I get to show. That's why I like is I get to show kind of the sweet <laughs> side of Jake when yeah. I post because a lot of people don't get to see it. I feel like he should show it. I get it's tough boxer man, but he has a really sweet side when he wants to. And you guys went to people that uh, work on relationships. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We talked. Relationships to a are hard. They're a lot of work, especially really with, like you said, the pressure of the social media, pressure of fans, pressure of like boxing, training camp. Training camp is a pressure that's on a, on a relationship, so. Anything you <laughs> want to like do well in and have success in like, yeah. takes work, right? Well, I say, yeah, we work on our bodies at the gym. You know, we work on our businesses in the office. When are you working on your relationship? Yeah. When you are, you know, committing to be with somebody else, that's a whole nother person that you have to worry about, care about, and live your whole entire life with and make sure they're okay. And sometimes that's not easy. Again, especially like, I'm young, my, my parents were divorced. I never had a good relationship to witness, to emulate. I mean, and same with same her with parents. Me, same with me, like I'm from small town Texas and gone through the same stuff with parents and stuff. So it's like, but then we bonded over that too, I think. So yeah. it's tough because it's like a bittersweet thing where we can bond over it, but it's also how do you heal from it together and learn to love each other. The relationship first started when he was, I believe, already in training camp. So this mm -hmm. is kind of all you've known, but kind of a strange existence, right? Yeah, well, I think it's such a good thing because I got to meet, and we kept it very private when we first started dating, but I got to meet sober training camp, Jake Paul dialed in, completely focused, and that's the Jake I fell in love with was, it wasn't the Jake Paul, you know, being crazy, even though I love that part of him too, but the first person I got to know was him really dialed in, focused, and training really hard, and so it's kind of where our relationship thrived, and I loved being there helping out, so I love it. So since I was 15 years old, uh, I would have a goal. It started with one goal and I, I would write it down on a piece of paper and put it uh, on my mirror and say it to myself. Back then it was, I, Jake Paul, will become one of the best wrestlers in the state of Ohio. And I just said it to myself every morning and manifested it. What, what are some of your favorites up here? Face your fear because your goal demands it. My fear is losing. 
and uh, I have to face the, the possibility of that to reach my goal, which is to go 10 and 0 and to become a world champion in boxing. Uh, I'm gonna to attempt to tag along with okay. you for a, a little bit. Are you gonna go first and, or second? Uh, so we have both. Uh, oh, okay, both is this one ready yet. too? Let's go. Um, Amazing. Right, wait, what's the, what's your temperature on that one? Temperature thing's frozen in here. 35? 35. That's what, 39? Yeah, yours is a 40. Okay. So, all right, so mine's a little, little warmer. Easier. Not bad though, not bad. Here we go. Three, two, oh. one. <sighs> it's cold. It's cold, right? Yeah. How are you feeling? Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> what are tips? Uh, deep breaths. It's also like, close your eyes, take a couple deep breaths. First minute's the worst, for sure. And the benefit of this is what? It's uh, in, it's inflammation buildup, and then this like sort of flushes that out, it shocks your body, puts you in you know uncomfortable situation where your body has to respond and grow and adapt. I'm very surprised how well you're doing. Really? Yeah, you gotta try and get your shoulders. In. Why? <laughs> That's where that's where the soreness comes from. I put my hands in this time. Yes, the hands are brutal. Really like takes your breath away. <laughs> Welcome to training camp. Yeah. So that's one. It's where you'll feel like yeah, you'll start to tingle and. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Do you find you like the monotony of the training schedule? I do. I actually really do. It, it's a love-hate relationship because some at some moments, you know, you I want to go be a 24-year-old kid. Right. I'm the type of person that's sort of attracted to chaos, in a sense, and I just want to, you know, be in the scene or the parties or the fun. And down here, there's no distractions. Puerto Rico has become the best thing possible for me in this stage of my career of being a boxer and having to train nonstop because I know that people are coming for me. Eventually I wanna become a world champion just to say I did it because no one will believe that it's possible because I was a YouTuber or whatever. People have doubted you your whole life though, dating back to when you were a kid in school. I feel like I've, I've always been an underdog. And again, it still continues to this day. He's not a boxer, he's not this. He, you know, fight someone real, uh, they have a million things to say. And I will just check off the list of proving every single person wrong until they have to respect me. Check out the kitchen. Let's do it. So diet's obviously a, a big part of your life now. Uh, tell me about what it entails. Pretty much, uh, only eating for fuel, but I have a big breakfast, uh, tons of egg whites, uh, omelet, toast. I eat raw liver, actually. What? Uh, it's like supposedly supposed to just be one of the best things you could possibly eat. Oh, that looks disgusting. Yeah, it is. You have that every day? Yeah. Like, couple ounces. This is my pink Himalayan sea salt. You may have heard about this, but sure. drink this in the morning. It has like tons of minerals and it's great for the sodium. That helps with energy. Um, and then, yeah, just like your, your standard stuff. Pretty much just eating like chicken, salmon, black rice, broccoli, asparagus, uh, and different variations of that same thing. This is Dorado Beach East, and uh, just an amazing neighborhood and community. What made you decide on here? Honestly, the, the moment I got here, I just fell in love with it. I can go to the beach without there being paparazzi. In, in other places, when I lived in LA and, and Miami, I just felt like almost like a prisoner in my own house. Just like, boom, this is the perfect area to train. I just come. 
right out my front door, hit a three, four, five mile jog in the most beautiful places. I try to come out here like twice a week. And usually I just will sit right over here and like meditate for 10, 15, 20 minutes, envision the fight, envision the win. And uh, yeah, clear my mind and get, get ready for the whole week and the whole training camp. You want to run through a little, little quick meditation thing? Yeah, sure. Do whatever you want to think about, let go of the, the day, let go of any stresses and listen to the ocean, listen to the music and try and like send yourself focus on the breath. So we'll go for our first 10 breaths in three, two, one. Three, two, one. All the way out. You can tap your body. Wake yourself up. Hold. I've never done that before. You really kind of get in touch with your surroundings and... Feels good. What got you into that? Man, I'm, I started to become very just spiritual and uh, my life was just crazy, hectic. I, I felt like I was like lo lost control of my life and like who I was and just doing that every day in the morning and at night helped me like ground myself, center myself, and uh, it, it's, it's helped me immensely, man. Like, words can't even explain.